So my name is Keith Baldwin. I'm a technical solutions architect for enterprise networking under the campus automation team. Uh, I help cover identity services engines, software defined access and automation and programmability uh, in the enterprise space. Today, uh, I'm going to help cover IBN S 2.0 and some of the automation methodologies that are out there and why we might need automation. And as anybody has uh, played around with IBNS before, there are always adoption barriers, right? And usually that's because of a number of different reasons, right? They are typically it's the client that you'll find. The clients that we might have might have limitations because of a supplicant or perhaps there's, there's a requirement for an IP address on a specific type of in, uh, interface on a device and the device reboots if it doesn't get an IP address. It makes it difficult, right? Um, the, next, the next barrier is the hardware limitations and software limitations that the platforms have. We've got to get alignment across the infrastructure, not just from a hardware perspective, but also a software perspective, because some of the features that we need to be able to utilize, we need to get across the network infrastructure to make our job of adoption easier, right? Then when we start to look at the whole configuration, there's not just configuration complexity where the commands are, are being pushed out to those various different authenticators, but also the solution complexity where we have to tie together multiple different systems and integrate them. And so the whole thing from soup to nuts in adopting 802.1x can seem a little bit daunting. And and as such, people usually go for the easy option, which is to deal with the wireless environment and negate doing the wired environment. Today, we're going to focus on the wired environment and we're going to focus in on some of the ways that you can really make that job a lot easier. First of all, you know, it is ice. It is a nice mess. Uh, a seminar, but uh, DNA Center integration with Identity Services Engine has come a heck of a long way. You know, when we start to look at what the capabilities are of either platform and how they work together, it allows us to not only get the information we need or the configurations we need on the devices for Identity Services Engine, but also it helps us to integrate some of those build processes within ICE. And so as we tie both of these platforms together, we get more of a solution, which allows us to grow the 802.1x environment across our network infrastructure and get to that end-to-end -end policy that we're all looking for. As with anything, it, everything is about balance, right? So on the right-hand side, there's a lot of complexity that I have to learn about this big digger that I need to move all of this earth. And, you know, it's going to make me make light work of large piles of earth and that sort of thing. While on the other side, if I use a shovel, you know, it's easy to use. It means a heck of a lot more work. But if I have three tons of earth to move, I'm not going to like to use that shovel. So so everything is about balance. And where DNA C comes in, it is a little bit more complex to integrate and perhaps use, but the benefits far outweigh all the negatives. From an automation perspective, when we start to look at the whole life cycle, right, it's about that continually learning, continually evolving network infrastructure. And I know that's the story you've probably heard many, many times, but for me, when I start to look at it, it's all about that configuration, right? How do I make my configuration work for my clients for an 802.1x environment and continually improve that? right? I'm going to get all of the benefits of model-driven telemetry. I'm going to get the benefits of the optimization for performance and that sort of thing. That's terrific. But I'm also going to learn about those 802.1x failures and be able to tune timers and things of that nature through the templates and the automation that I push. And so from a perspective of tying this whole thing together, it makes those things easier, not to mention pushing out the code that I might need for a specific platform. And so end-to-end -end networking um, policy is where we're, we're headed. Obviously, from a SDN perspective, 
you know, it's always about what the demands are of the business and how we translate that off uh, over to the network infrastructure. But from an intent based networking point of view, right, we want to be able to orchestrate these policies in a very, very seamless fashion. And SDA, while not many have adopted it, is a very easy flow for onboarding switching into the network infrastructure. Over the last couple of years, we have evolved SDA and allowed for it to work with unmanaged devices from a layer two connectivity perspective to the fabric, as well as at, uh, policy extended nodes, which are tied off of the, uh, the, the rest of the fabric. So this allows us to dynamically build those configurations what we might need for catalyst environments or even uh, IE switching. But it also, in the un on the far left, allows us to deal with devices that are not going to be part of the fabric and just layer two connected. So we can still have our traditional networking connected off of the fabric as well. And that allows us to have this migration platform from the left-hand side, traditional networking, all the way over to the right-hand side, right, where we start to move towards the fabric. And, and as we start to look at it, it gives us this other, this other methodology of thinking about it where we can still use the traditional network if we want to. Most of what I'm going to cover today is in the traditional space, and so you'll be happy to know it's not SDA-focused. From a primer perspective, I'm going to cover quickly some general stuff about 802.1x, just to bring everybody up to speed. And so from an 802.1x perspective, right, we have this EAP session that typically starts and allows for that authorization of the device, and then we get the IP address that comes across to the, the client. Obviously, that's not going to work for some of those difficult clients out there, right? And so you know, having a policy that you're going to push out to a, a device, a network access device, has to have that capability of dealing with the easy uh, devices that we're going to get on there, which have a great supplicant in them, like Windows uh, operating systems and Macintosh and that sort of thing, but also the difficult ones, like uh, different vendors of ac access point that we might need to get onto the network infrastructure and connect at layer two. And so we do have that methodology of dealing with things with MAC address bypass. But obviously, MAC address bypass, we want to make sure that we profile those devices to make sure that they are what they say they are when they're joining the network. That avoids the MAC spoofing uh, cap uh, capabilities that some hackers like to make use of. Then as we roll out our, our policies and our, our our uh, uh, IBNS network and framework across the network infrastructure, we want to make sure that we follow through this idea of rolling from monitor mode and testing things where we might deploy low impact mode on specific clients that are having difficulty and where we're going to be using closed mode. So very much like a triage, we're going to make sure that we deal with all of those parts of the network infrastructure in the right way. Along with this, we'll use the monitor mode within the policy and make sure that we are aligning those things and testing the policy as well as the mode as we bring these devices in across the network. From a DNAC perspective, you can go in and change and tune the timers, um, especially for those templates, those authentication templates that are rolled out. And so that allows you to uh, adopt a, a, a more uh, aggressive timer for 802.1x and change the policy that's actually pushed out by DNA Center. While this is for the SDA environment, you could do the same sort of thing within the templating tool. And those authentication templates that we push out, we might uh, push out to a specific type of port, right? So where we need to, we can still use low impact mode or closed mode or even open mode or open auth on a specific on a specific interface. A little bit about low impact mode and closed mode before we carry on. Uh, so 
Low impact mode, remember that that allows for you to have a pre-auth ACL to protect the network environment. Um, and, and so that's, that's there to allow for you to get certain services that you might need through to that client so that it doesn't perhaps reboot because it didn't get an IP address from DHCP. Close mode, however, close off uh, all, of the, uh, uh, all of the traffic except for CDP, L LLDP, and the 802.1x EAP uh, protocols, right? So those are allowed to go through. Um, so that's why you might need to choose one mode over the other for a specific type of client that's connecting. But it also presents a problem. When you change modes for authentication on a specific port, that causes that port's um, session to restart. So you're going to want to do that in a controlled way. From an IBM S2.0 perspective, think of it as, you know, in the early days, in clean, <laughs> Cisco clean access days, which I can remember long ago, um, you know, we had we had some very basic capabilities, you know, or bouncing ports and all of that sort of thing. But but as we started to adopt ACS and, and the IBM S 1.0 framework and started moving towards Identity Services Engine 1.0, we started to get all of these capabilities of web authentication, failing, you know, your auth fail VLANs, your guest VLANs and so forth. And as we move to the right-hand side, to IBM S2.0, we get the capabilities of interface templates, uh, critical ACLs for AAA failures and things of that nature, and a graceful policy that allows us to fail through rather than tying those uh, specific port modes to a, an interface itself. From a motivations perspective, right, the critical ACL is there basically to allow us to deal with an, a AAA uh, failure, right? So in the event the AAA server is unreachable, you know, I'm going to get an ACL that's going to allow me to get certain types of access onto the network infrastructure, right? Differentiated access or authentication, that allows for me to authenticate to different radius environments uh, for my sessions and my clients that are joining the network infrastructure. So if my phones to go to one system while my laptops might go to another. Flexible authentic authorizations allows us to have a policy which fails through. You know, if I fail through, I might get to the web off page. Or if, I, if I'm authenticated at 802.1x or I have a supplicate, it allows for me to have that graceful methodology of failing through. In the configuration bloat, we're going to uh, deal with a lot of configuration that would actually get uh, cause the, the config on the device to be huge, uh, reduce that with interface templates. <clears throat> so as we start to look at uh, inter, you know, the identity configurations, we're going to take a look at the, the CLI a little bit. From a global AAA perspective, things really haven't changed too much. There's a couple of new commands there, but for the most part, things are pretty much the same. In IBNS, where things really made a difference is when we start to look at how we tie those policies and port modes to the interface. So on the left there, you'll see the uh, 802.1x uh, order is defined right on the interface. And so this is a very malleable. Right? And so by having this policy on the right-hand side where we start to pull out the uh, priority and the order uh, into a policy. This allows us to adapt that to a, a template and then use that template on a specific interface. From an IBNS perspective, when we start to look at 2.0, we have this idea of an identity control policy which has our events, our classes, and our actions in it. We have a service template, which is used uh, to define services like access voice VLANs and control lists and, and SGTs and, and things of that nature. We have interface templates, which are used and defined 
can be used in change of authorizations, can be statically or dynamically attached to interfaces for specific sessions. And then we have our physical interfaces where the devices connect to. As we start to look at the identity control policy, we have our events, our classes, and our actions still. So the events basically are like when the session starts or, or an authentication failure. The classes are, are basically, you know, what's, what's going on and how is that happening? And then the actions are, okay, this is what I'm going to do, right? So as I start to look at that from the left-hand side, you can see it color-coded on the right-hand side. You know, so when the session starts, I'm going to do this until failure, right? And then I'm going to authenticate using 802.1x, right? In the event of a failure, right, which is a second event, I'm going to have multiple classes. So in the first class, if AAA is down, I'm going to terminate 802.1x and authorize. And I have other methodologies for if .1x is no response, or if uh, 1x fails entirely. When I start to read that identity control policy, right, when the session starts, uh, when I get a new Mac learned on a port, okay, I'm gonna do this until failure unconditionally, which is the, 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 the class. And then the action is I'm going to do 802.1x uh, and there is a priority there of 10. You can have additional uh, statements in there with different priorities. And you can build this out as you want to, right? It's not completely defined, if you like. You can build this out as you need to. From an authentication failure event, right, um, what's going to happen next is I'm going to have, uh, in the first one here, no response right from the endpoint. So in this case, I'm going to terminate 802.1x and I'm going to authenticate using MAC address bypass. In the, in the next class, right, MAB has failed, right? And I'm going to terminate MAB and authentication restart in 60 seconds. So restart the whole thing. And the last one, if an if agent is found, then I have a methodology of dealing with that as well. So very malleable, critical VLANs and ACLs from before authentication, we have this pre-auth ACL that we might put on to a, a, a port in, in low impact mode. When we have an authentication success happen, a dynamically ACL will get pushed down to the interface, which will override that pre-auth ACL giving full access, right? Because that port has been authorized for, for that specific client. And that's per session, right? And then lastly, we have that uh, AAA server unreachable environment. So I have defined a critical VLAN and a, and a pre-auth ACL, which allows me to deal with uh, AAA outages. When we start to look at the legacy configuration to the new style mode, as we look at that port configuration in more detail, we can actually take a look at what that might look like by utilizing this command. And so this is a command in the iOS, which allows us to then take that older configuration and take a peek at what that might look like in new style, right? And it will spit out a policy for you, which you can then build into a template to allow you to roll that out across the network. So if you've already put out 802.1x with IBNS 1.0 and are thinking about using IBNS 2.0, this is the command that might help you. It's also important to mention that uh, DNA Center by default does roll out IBNS 2.0. And you'll see here that there's the policy map it, we're, we're looking at the class map. It pushes all of this information out. There's also a configuration mode display command, which will actually take you from the legacy to the new style. This is a non-reversible procedure, so make sure you back up your configuration beforehand. 
um, should you need to go back to or, or revert back to the old style. Do it in a lab first. From an automation perspective, now you will remember that we, we talked about that moving from low impact mode to perhaps um, closed mode and how that might be difficult. And we're gonna talk about some of the capabilities that there are inherent to iOS right now that will help us to get around some of these challenges. So back in the day, there was this uh, auto, uh, auto smart port macro that would be pushed out or could be used on an iOS type device. Uh, this has been superseded by AutoConf. But the smart port was basically like a macro in Excel where you, where you pressed the play button and it, it changed something on behalf of the macro. Right? So the macro would go in and make changes in Excel. Well, very much the same sort of thing that's going on on a switch. As you plugged in a device, the macro would see that specific device and because of its type or nature would change the port configuration to match that type of device, right? So very much a macro based engine that was on the iOS back in the day. They've, they've superseded this or come out with the next gen of this, which is the autoconf capability. An autoconf makes use of interface templates back in the smart port days where we changed the actual configuration on the interface, we don't do that anymore. We change the dynamic nature of assigning a specific interface template to, or a, a, assigning it to an interface, right? So that allows us to be a bit more dynamic. We have our port configuration, but we add and remove commands dynamically based on the session using, using interface templates. So it's like an overlay. So AutoConf allows us to use, make use of something called device classification, right? And on the switch, there is a device classifier built in, which actually will uh, make use of CDP, LLDP, uh, DHCP, and the Mac OUIs. And so you can build the policy in any which way you want to. And the interface templates themselves, built in or user defined, right? So I can build out my own interface templates as I want to to make use of AutoConf capabilities. Those interface templates are built out, you know, and we're just looking at the built in ones here um, on switches uh, from, I, from the iOS platform and, and at iOS XC. And so as you start to look at this, you'll, you'll see that there are lots of different types of template there for different types of devices. And so this allows us to make use of those or reuse the configuration that's there without having to build our own if we, if we would like to. Additionally, AutoConf has a hierarchy. And so there is this idea of tying a policy to the system and when we've tied that specific policy to the system, there is a parameter map. And that parameter map allows us to use regex information to determine from the device classifier what type of device it is, whether that be a Cisco IP phone or camera or DMP or access point or, or some other type of device. It will even show Aruba type devices. So if an access point from Aruba was to plug in, it would be identified by the system automatically using LLDP. You do have to turn LLDP on for that. And so on the right-hand side, this allows us to map an interface template to that specific, that specific um, mapping statement for that type of device. So in the case of IP phone on the left, we have interface template for IP phone interface template that's been defined on the system. That might be a, a built-in template that we're using, or it might be a, man, a manually defined one or custom one. As we start to look at customized hierarchy, we're just changing out. We can change out the entire template. We can change out pieces of the template. We can add sections onto the template or the parameter map. 
And so we have the capability of building out the parameter map uh, as we want to, augmenting it, changing it in any which way we want to, or defining a completely new one. And we also have the capability of building out or using the built-in templates or writing our own. We can do what we like. How this starts to come together is that if we start to look at a, a, an access point joining the interface, we, we might have defined at the top right there, you'll see source template access point. And all the rest of the configuration that might be there might have been in the interface template. This allows us to define perhaps pre-auth ACLs or, or what have you to be able to pour, uh, bring on that specific device. And this is an IBNS 2.0 methodology. From a perspective of looking at all of this, on the left-hand side, you'll see that that template was statically assigned to that specific port. And so you can see that's done by that top right statement where it says source template access point. So great, we can statically define things and bind them to the interfaces, but how do we actually switch from one mode to the other? So there's a couple of methodologies of doing that. The easiest methodology would be to make use of the onboard profiling capability in Identity Services Engine, define policies um, for profiling, make sure that those logical profiles are built out. You know, however, we might want to build out the, the classification of those. We can completely define it or redefine it. And then to have that assign as, as part of the authentication, looking at that specific endpoint, then to assign through a change of authorization an interface template that actually changes the behavior of the port based off of a interface template defined on the, on the device, right? So on the network access device, we might have an interface template, maybe a flex access point, and we might change the behavior of the port to use that, that uh, defined interface after authentication and authorization. And you're going to see that in the demo. So this would allow us, after authentication, to then have, even though on the top right we still have our source template access point defined, we now have a different template being used on the interface. And you can see that we're using show-derived interface, GI102. This allows us to basically change or see what is actually dynamically defined on an interface for that specific session or sessions if there are multiple clients. And so you can see on the left-hand side, the interface binding. And there are two templates assigned, one stat statically and one dynamically to that interface. And it went from a switch port mode access to a, a trunk interface, right? Now, that still leaves a bit of a problem. We can't get from low impact mode to closed mode. How do we get past that little nut? So here we enter Embedded Event Manager. Embedded Event Manager is a tool that's on iOS X E and allows us to basically make use of small scripts that can be written in CLI and TCL, Python, whatever methodology you might like, and basically have an if then else capability of, okay, if something happens and something else happens, I might want to do this, this procedure. There are a number of detectors that are supported there. And so we're gonna make use of some of those detectors to make sure that the configuration happens on a specific interface. If we want to modify an interface from low impact mode to closed mode or vice versa, right? So how do we make use of this? Well, when that event happens, it's gonna trigger a script within an applet, and that applet will have that iOS configuration. And that iOS configuration will be pushed out to that specific interface. 
in the event that a, a host disable, uh, disables a port or, or unplugs from the interface, right, and, it, and the port goes down, we might want something to happen. And that might be that that port gets put back to a base configuration where it's using a 802.1x closed mode configuration. So here, this is what's gonna happen. The interface goes down, the, it's not a port channel, so we don't have to worry about uh, writing over port channels unnecessarily. And so if that happens, then we're going to take that port and put that port back into closed mode. So from then on, it will have a closed mode template assigned. When when something uh, gets when something gets connected to the interface, right? I, I might want to have that methodology of dealing with low impact mode, right? So maybe it's an ACL, maybe or sorry, an access point, and and so as that access point starts to power up, there's going to be a message that comes through to the system, and we want to make use of that message, or maybe some CDP information or LLDP information if we want to be more specific here. And we can use all of that to determine, okay, it's not a port channel. The port came up. It has a power. It's got power that's being applied. And it happens to be of a device type access point, Aruba access point, or what have you. And so that point, we need a low impact mode on that specific interface. And we would dynamically use this methodology to write over the interface configuration with a, a, a static assignment of that source template. And that would allow us to get to that low impact mode template for that specific type of device. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna do a little demo, because everybody likes demo. And I've stopped sharing accidentally. Press the wrong button. And so within dCloud, I've set up a, a small little demonstration. I, I rolled out this configuration via um, DNA Center entirely. We can go into that if we need to. We have some time. if I can log in. All right, <clears throat> so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make this easier for us to read it. And you'll notice that there is an access point that's connected already to port 102, okay? That it went through and it was authenticated with MAC address bypass. We're gonna take a look at the at the port in a little bit more detail, but we're gonna compare it to the port beside it. So the port that we have the AP connected to, right? You'll notice it's been dynamically named. We'll talk about that in a minute, but, but it's also got uh, just a basic configuration that you would expect, except for this source template, right? The source template is what we used in the, in the PowerPoint slides, where you see that access point configuration there. The other port, uh, port one, you'll notice is similarly configuration except, uh, configured, except that it's got a source template of workstation. And so this allows for us to have that dynamic capability um, of, of applying a specific policy for 802.1x methodologies in closed mode. And that would be the template that gets pushed out to specific devices across the, the entire network infrastructure, right? The interface templates we would use would also get rolled out, but they would get used on a specific use case. And we'll talk about that as we go through it. So these templates show up in the system. And so here's the workstation template with the closed mode configuration. You can quite clearly see that, it, that we have our VLANs assigned within here. We also have other bits and pieces, and we're defined a service policy of closed mode. 
in the low impact mode, we are still using the closed mode off, but we are also making sure that we have a dynamic ACL assigned um, in the event that we need to uh, get an, an IP address on that specific client. And the same is true on the access point, right? So the access point is also a closed mode configuration. Now you'll notice that there's this access point and then a flex access point template. We're gonna change the behavior of our port over to a trunk port dynamically by authorization, okay? So one extra bit that we're gonna do inside the demo here. As we start to look at those two interfaces side by side from a derived perspective, right? We can see that the derived configuration for the sessions on interface 101 in closed mode has a lot more configuration in here. You didn't see the VLANs assigned in the, in the, uh, the static configuration on the, on the interface, but you do see them assigned here inside the, inside the uh, derived configuration, along with all the rest of the 802.1x parameters. For 102, similarly, but you're seeing a, uh, you're also seeing that trunk interface. So this device has been on the network a little while and it has been authorized and, and given a trunk interface uh, for the session that is in. So now those devices that are getting onboarded through the wireless controller are, go are gonna get put into those VLANs and connected to the network infrastructure. Remember that we are not gonna be authenticating them as they join because this session is already authorized. All right. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna shut down the switch port and see what happens. So as I shut down that specific interface, the port goes down and you'll notice that it, it'll go and do something, it'll say, installing base configuration. And so that base configuration in that EEM script is basically going and whacking the port with that base configuration, which is that, that uh, workstation template, right? So closed mode, it sends that port back to closed mode. As, as that port starts to come back up again, you'll see that there's this power granted message that comes in and immediately the switch knows it's got to do something. So it goes and it makes some changes to the interface and it pushes out a low impact mode template to that specific interface, right? And that port will still be coming up now. So I'm gonna go and take a look at the port as it's sitting right now. So as we look at that specific port, we'll see that it's got the description is, is just AP config, which you got from that, that uh, small CLI script. You'll see that the source template is access point, And you'll see here that it's not in drive mode. You haven't got that trunk interface yet, right? So this, this AP is still powering up, right? And it's connected to the, to the network. So we're waiting for some CDP information and the device to be classified, right? As that port comes up and the client lands onto the network, we should start to see CDP information. The joys of demos. There it is. And then we should start to see some other bits and pieces. So the device classifier should fire and we see that the device classifier has showed that it is a um, uh, 9130. And immediately we get authenticated with MAC address bypass by identity services engine. So it went from that, that a uh, specific interface where we didn't have a trunk interface to a derived configuration where we have a, a trunk interface 
We've authenticated the AP onto the network. And now the clients that are authenticated by the wireless environment will be handed off to that layer two trunk down to the switched infrastructure. But we also have some other powerful commands here. So we have this uh, show access session interface command. This gives us the same sort of information that we would get from the its predecessor, which was the show authorization session interface, GI102, right? Where we can see the MAC address, uh, we can see the uh, authorization and the, the method of MAC address bypass, and we can see some information here. This second command though, where we put the detail at the end of it, this gives us a capability of looking at a, li at a little bit more detail, right? So we will see here, the multi-auth is, is the mode, and that's the default mode, by the way, on Catalyst switches now. But also you'll see that we've got the device type that was found. You'll see the IP address, the MAC address. Of course, it's showing up as username because that was the MAC address bypass that we used. You'll see the session information, and you'll see what was a resultant policy. So it, this was sent back from, from ICE, right? We'll see the uh, session timeout is 3,600 seconds, the VLAN assignment, and we'll see the interface template that was dynamically assigned to the interface and the overall success message. And then lastly, that show template binding target command that allows us to see the, the two different types of templates that were assigned to the, to the device uh, dynamically. As we've got some extra time, I'm going to go into Identity Services Engine and show how I built this out. So the whole network infrastructure is completely automated at this point by uh, identity or DNA Center. Um, and that includes tying in DNA Center to, uh, to identity service, DNA Center to identity services engine. And so within our hierarchy, seconds while I get rid of those little screens. As I start to look at the settings, you'll see that triple A is used for 802.1x authentication, and I'm pointing this over to ICE. So that's the first little nugget. When a device is learned by, by DNA Center, it will automatically add it to Identity Services Engine as a NAD. So as I look at my NADs that are onto the network infrastructure, the one I care about at the moment is this one, right? And so it'll not just populate out all the information and connectivity for the device with all of the various different credentials, but it'll also pro help provision the PAX certificate down to, down to, the, uh, to the device through CTS messaging. So that whole information is getting passed backwards and forwards between DNA Center, the switch, or, or the wireless device, and uh, Identity Services Engine, making that rollout a little bit easier. From a telemetry perspective, this is where all the telemetry comes back to. You can obviously add um, Identity Services Engine if you wanted to have it for SNMP traps and so forth. 
from an image perspective, we, uh, we can upgrade images to make sure that we're using the right image for a specific device and actually used identity services engine to, or sorry, um, a DNA center to fix a problem with the image on the device uh, yesterday as I was building out the lab for today. The authentication templates. So this is used pretty much for the uh, for for the SDA environment, but I just wanted to show it quickly. We can adjust these timers as we need to, and within a fabric, we can we can adopt these modes at even the port level. But for the rest of the network, right, we're going to make use of the template editor, and so the template editor allows us to build out a set of templates logical and construct from a composite sequence perspective and dragging these in and out as we need to. So we can make modifications to this over time and we can make use of logical constructs to configure our interfaces if we need to. And you can see here, I've rolled out the templates and, and tied that back to the device. From an ICE perspective, to tie the whole thing together, and we kind of talked about it a little bit, but I'm going to go into it in more detail. There's a, pro, a policy element, or sorry, profiling, into the wrong thing, profiling policies from a logical perspective that I added here, where I grouped various different access point um, policies to it. So this allowed me to look for a specific type of access point that was connected to the network and to then apply a session. The next part of the puzzle was to build out an authorization profile. And so that authorization profile was used to define all of those parameters. And if you remember, I used um, a VLAN identifier VLAN identifier, which could be the name. If you want to use the name, you can absolutely do that. Uh, the the reauthentication timer and uh, the interface template. And so the resultant policy is what would be applied, and we saw that applied on the switched infrastructure. And then lastly, from a policy set perspective, yeah, I've got any changes. Inside my authorization pol policy, can't speak this morning, uh, I've got the uh, this one that I've added here, profiled uh, flex access points. Let's make this a little larger. And so you'll see here that, oh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, you'll see here that it says endpoints logical profile, I'll go to the one underneath, equals uh, Cisco AP, right? And then I've chosen my profile that I want to be assigned. So as that device comes onto the network infrastructure, it gets that interface template assigned dynamically. As the port goes down and somebody unplugs it, it gets whacked with the, the closed mode authentication template. And then, and then if it plugs in uh, an AP with a power event, maybe LLDP, CDP information, if we want to add those, you can. It would then get the low mo low impact mode uh, authorization template and then consequently continue auth authenticating through MAP. So you can dynamically change your network infrastructure. So there's more dynamic for the types of devices that are actually uh, joining the network. And the last thing I'll close off with here is just looking at the authentication that's actually coming through here. You can see that it actually went to a, a Cisco Dash device uh, endpoint classifier. Um, and, and here it's got Cisco Flex access point. So this one is actually underneath that logical profile and still we're getting the, the Flex access points um, showing up. So you can almost change this any which way you want to. Recently, I did this for um, an Aruba AP, uh, but as you as you go through the the bits and pieces here, you can see that we're using that authorization profile, 
and that we are assigning as a result that interface template. That's all I had to show. Um, go back to the slide deck. I'm sure you, you want at this point to know more. Uh, where can I get these wonderful toys? Well, you can find them on the ICE resource pages, uh, but also inside this slide deck, I've added a, a bunch of other links to a lot of different information that I've put up on GitHub, Automation Exchange for DevNet, and Cisco blogs. I also make high, high, highly recommend the Secure Access Prescriptive Deployment Guide, which I use to, uh, I, I reference frequently. That's all I had to say today. I hope, uh, hope you found it informative and if there are any questions, I'll, I'll, I'll take those.